strategies? Most of the strategies that we try, like factoring, looking for Pythagorean identity, changing everything to sines and cosines, don't work. And then weird things work. And this next thing I'm going to show you is something I probably would have never thought of unless somebody showed me a long time ago how to do it. Whenever you have something that's a fraction and there's two things on the bottom, one of them's a one usually and one's a trig function, the strategy here is to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. Now, you might not remember what conjugate means. It means basically look at that fraction that you see on the bottom one minus one. and multiply by what you see but change the sign. So I'm going to multiply by 1 over 1 minus the sine of x. That's the conjugate. Now when you do this, what you'll see happening is this fraction turns out to be 1 over and when you multiply these two things, this becomes the difference of two squares. Kind of like x plus 3, x minus 3 being multiplied would be x squared minus 9. Same kind of deal. On the bottom, you get 1 minus the sine squared of x. Now, at this point in time, I want to tell you there's a completely ridiculous error that I did on purpose that nobody's mentioned yet. This is completely wrong. Who knows what that error is? Uh, Mason. Can you just like not multiply by anything that's not one? That's right. I can't use this purple fraction on the left because it has to be a one. Like sine over sine or seven over seven. You can't just add junk in. So the top had to be one minus the sine of x when you multiply. So make sure that you're paying attention. You can't just multiply by anything you want to. So 1 minus the sine over 1 minus the sine is fine, which is the conjugate. So now, the reason I'm telling you that is it's actually 1 minus the sine. You don't have to change much, but it's 1 minus the sine on the top and 1 minus the sine squared on the bottom. Just don't forget, you, you can't just multiply in. You have to actually multiply by 1, no matter what it looks like. Down below, I see 1 minus the sine squared. If you were to look in your Pythagorean identities, you would see that this actually has an identity. So that thing is really the same thing as the cosine squared. And you can find that if you want. And then on the top, I still have that 1 minus the sine. Now, the reason you're doing this, and it doesn't really, at least to me, doesn't really look like that much simpler, is that you can now rewrite this. And they told us in the beginning, kind of the most important thing that you might not have read right away, is this. All they care about is to rewrite it not in fraction format. Do I still have a fraction? Yeah. Yeah, so still not good. But I can, if I want, do this. I can, if I want, rewrite this and split it apart into two pieces. Meaning, have you ever heard that phrase, if it looks like a heart, break it apart? Do you remember that? No. Well, if you haven't, here's what it means. If there's a binomial on the top of a fraction, meaning two things separated by a plus or a minus, and only one term on the bottom, you can rewrite it as this. And what you'll notice is after you write it, if you were to go backwards from the blue into the red and brown, you could put the numerators together, get 1 minus the sine, and it has a common denominator of cosine squared. So all I did is to separate it into two pieces. Now that still looks like it's ridiculous. Like, we don't want fractions. Why did we do that? Well, here's the thing. If 1 over the cosine is secant, then 1 over the cosine squared has to be secant squared. So the first fraction 
really becomes secant squared. Notice how there's no fraction anymore because it was a reciprocal identity. The second one looks like it's a little bit harder, but here's what I want to point out. That sine of x on the top is really the same thing as the sine of x times 1. So if I wanted to rewrite that second blue fraction, I could do this. Because the sine of x times 1 is sine x, and cosine times cosine is cosine squared. So very tricky how they get down to this thing. And your final answer you would write as the secant squared of x minus the tangent of x times the secant of x. Notice how there are no fractions, and that's all they wanted. Just write it with no fractions. Okay, so there are two main strategies that you could use in number seven. One of the ones, the first one that was mentioned, which I really like, one of my favorites, is a common denominator. How many people use that one? Excellent. And the second one, the one that Shaw mentioned, was the... Part, break it apart. Just in time for Valentine's Day. So I'm going to use Shaw's example because I actually think that one's going to work better in this case, but I'm not sure. So here's my heart that I'm going to break apart on this one. And then there's also the one that I'm going to break apart in the other one. In the orange, if I break it apart, I will see the sine of theta over the sine of theta times oh. cosine theta, no, that's not what I meant, sorry, plus oh. cosine of theta over sine of theta. And in the purple, if I break that one apart, I will see negative cosine theta over cosine theta plus sine theta over cosine theta. Does that look right? Yes, sir. Wow. Okay. Wow. So, um, talk to me about this fraction. One. So one. That's nice. So I have one plus, and then in the orange, cosine over sine is called. <laughs> cotangent, and then the second thing I notice is I see this stuff, one. which is negative one, good observation, and then the last one in the purple is the same as tangent theta, and then at the end, what you should notice is that um, the ones cancel out, and you just get cotangent theta plus the tangent of theta. Yes. Oh. Okay, so this is the last example that I'm going to do for you. It says expand and simplify. And you see two parentheses, so you think fail or multiply yeah, awesome. binomial expansion. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go cotangent times cotangent, which is cotangent what? squared. And then I'm going to go with cotangent times cosecant, which is negative cotangent cosecant. Well, can't write today. All right. And then I have cosecant times cotangent, which is positive cosecant cotangent. And then I see cosecant times negative cosecant, which is negative cosecant squared. Yes! No! Yes! Here's what I notice. Gone. That's nice, right? 
now I have <coughs> cotangent squared of x minus cosecant squared of x. Oh, man, I see a couple of squared things. What should I be thinking, do you think? There's probably a rule. What kind of a rule? Trig trig and oh, no. very good rule. Pythagorean. Yes, very good, Drew. Pythagorean rule. Oh, Drew, Pythagorean you pick one. cotangent squared or cosecant squared. Which one you want to work with? Okay, let's look at the cotangent squared right here. In your notes under the Pythagorean identities, that has a rule associated with it. What is the cotangent squared the same thing as? Tristan. Uh, is it? Cosecant? No way. Cosecant squared. Cosecant squared. Oh, squared. Okay, so cosecant squared x minus 1. That's the cotangent squared? Okay. So I'm going to highlight that. So this is that stuff. And then over here, I still have in the blue minus cosecant squared of x. Oh my goodness. Dun, 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 dun. Finished. Good job listening. That's all we're doing for today.